Hello and welcome to Profiles in Risk. This is your host, Tony Canyas, and today we're recording episode 230-something, and I have with me Noreen Vergara. Uh, who, Hello. Uh, has uh, spent, I think, all of her career uh, in the behavioral health side. So Noreen, thank you for Pretty joining much. us today. Thank you for having me. I, I, this is my first podcast, and so I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> uh, we'll see how this goes. You, you, you're not the first attorney we have, uh, but I do think that, that you are the first person from the behavioral health side. I, I've had only a couple of people from the health insurance side, but none from behavioral health. So uh, okay. you, you and I had a conversation, I think, a couple months ago that I thought was very interesting. And, and uh, thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to join me on, on the podcast. And, and uh, uh, my apologies, I, I, I rescheduled a couple of times because I'm bad at managing my calendar. Uh, so I very much appreciate you, you being flexible. No, thank you for having me. Awesome. So, so just before we started recording, you were telling me how behavioral health has gone through a lot of changes, especially on how it interacts with, with, with insurance. Sure. Uh, so, so, so yeah, what, 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 what's been going on on that side? Okay. So this is, this is probably why I think it's, or I enjoy working in behavioral health. You know, I'm on, I'm an attorney by training, so I'm on the, administration side but it's really an industry that is going through so much change and so much disruption and it's coming into its own i mean it just as you know not as far back as like 2000 2005 mental health and substance use benefits weren't weren't covered you know and if they were covered you had a very limited amount of benefit 30 days inpatient treatment or you had to get all sorts of um, jump through hoops and get certain reimbursement and certain rules to meet. Well, then all of a sudden, you know, now with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, you've got this whole industry coming out of coming out of the woods and just not only being able to access the insurance world and access the benefits world but it's being promoted. I mean, everywhere you look and you see how important behavioral health is and how much attention there is on it. And it's just really a sea change. Then on top of that, you've got disruption. You've got all of these teletherapy and, and resources that have really exploded because of COVID where um, you've got applications that offer therapy or things that you can do on your own. Um, it's, just, it's just a really exciting it's just a really exciting industry. So be, be, before ACA, uh, the the average uh, health insurance plan, or was it just about every health insurance plan, did not cover uh, the, the behavioral side at all? Most of them didn't, or they did only very limited. It was really common to have either mental health treatment completely excluded, and definitely substance use treatment completely excluded. And then if it was included, you would get 30 days of inpatient treatment a year, or you might get eight visits, 10 visits of outpatient therapy a year. Very limited ability to access any sort of medication, um, very limited ability to access different levels of treatment, you know, inpatient, and then there are some subacute kind of lower level, lower levels of care. Um, on an outpatient basis that weren't really um, that weren't really able to be used. So yeah, prior to it was really this for the Affordable Care Act in 2008, there was a federal law passed called the um, well we call it MAPIA now, but it was the Mental Health Parity Act. Addiction and, and substance use was added in 2010, and then really it kind of grew some legs in about 2013 and 2014 to now, mental health and substance use benefits are supposed to be on par and payable, you know, relatively comparably to medical. So, I mean, it's a huge sea change that just took place within the past, you know, 15 years or so from nothing to the same. That's very interesting that it wasn't covered because I would think, and I haven't seen any numbers on it, but I would think that... Uh, Behavioral health and and, and, and uh, substance abuse. Uh, I, I would think that it, that if we ignore those, 
they're going to lead to more expensive uh, general health uh, bills, right? So, so it it makes no sense that that, that we wouldn't cover them when uh, it's going to end up leading to 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 more expenses down down the line for the people that, that we insure. I'm sure that 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 the research is clear on that. True, but. You know, and that's something, you know, the research on mental health and substance use treatment has been um, kind of lagging, I guess, the medical side, um, both in the ability to do it and the knowledge of what we're actually measuring for. So I guess, you know, I worked in, before law school, I worked in an inpatient psychiatric hospital. And at that point in time, this is like the very late, 90s, very early 2000s. And at that time, there wasn't really the connection, I guess, that there is today between the mental um, kind of well being of the person and the physical well being of the person. So we knew they were connected, but there wasn't as much data and there wasn't as much support for it as, as you've got now. So it, it, took, it took a lot of years. Okay, and you you mentioned that the that technology is really disrupt, disrupting the space. So so basically, yeah. so the ACA opened the door, uh, and a bunch of technology providers figured that 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 this was a space that they could help with. And then I can only imagine after COVID, how 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 oh, that gosh, happened. COVID. Yeah. So so tell tell me about, about the kind of disruption that, that that you're seeing. What what are what are the technology providers uh, offering? Oh gosh. Okay. So let's see. Technology providers are offering things that you would think are very basic, either kind of what we think of as telehealth, where you can do video kind of therapy, like kind of like we're talking now. Um, There's several companies that are doing that, but they're also doing text therapy, which is a really interesting kind of mode of treatment in that You know, I don't have the studies in front of me, but there's research that kind of shows that the engagement rate of a patient with a a therapist through text is pretty much the same as face to face or it's on par with face to face, which is kind of shocking backwards. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of backwards when you think about it, but people are really able to connect with others through through text. Um, so they're doing that. One of the big hurdles for the tech industry to really kind of explode is the ability to get a HIPAA compliant and a secure platform. Once we got through that, and that was maybe, I don't know, five years ago ish. Now everybody's got a HIPAA compliant platform and there's so much ability to play and you've got applications that lets you record your mood and follow up with you on how you're doing. Um, If you are in recovery, let's say you've got a, um, you're recovering from an addiction and you've got, there's applications out there that will follow you and get someone to connect with you in person if you feel you're struggling and you might relapse. Um, There's just all sorts of companies. Now there's companies also on the payer side that exist to help get better cost of care, help push out best practices, help push out quality, um, and get better outcomes. So that's, I guess that's something that the Affordable Care Act really focused on was better outcomes. Let's, let's improve care. And by improving care, the cost will, the cost will get better also. Um, but there's this kind of really kind of fertile soil or soup or whatever you want to call it. And a lot of things started coming together in the past couple of years and then you've got covid and the need exploded and everybody got over their kind of fear of virtual you know interactions and now it's just it's a big big industry and it's just exciting to be a part of it i remember at the, at the beginning of covid when new york could hit first and uh, the, they uh, gave emergency licenses to therapists from other states mm-hmm. to 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 help uh, and it's gone on for so long. I mean, we're recording in April of 2021, and and uh, some of us are vaccinated, but but it's still very much ongoing. So I I think that we will be seeing the the long term impacts uh, on the psychologically and and 
for people that suffer from from addictions, this has to be a really, really, really uh, complex time. So it, it's very interesting to to hear. Uh, so so one one of those services that you talked about or, or checks in on you and and you know gets you help when you, when you need it. So, so basically, a a like twenty first century app version of the AA model or the NA model. Similar. Yeah, you know, I haven't checked actually to see if AA has a um, app. I, I assume they, they likely might. Um, but yes, there are specific types of therapies that companies have adopted and are pushing out, um, gosh, trainings and resources and all sorts of things that patients can use real time in their homes to help get them through kind of whatever tough spot they're getting. You mentioned the licensing and sort of the ability when COVID hit, all of the licensing kind of evaporated. And that was true definitely in telehealth. Um, it was really kind of interesting to be a part of kind of in the healthcare space when COVID happened. And I mean, it was just an emergency and rules were coming down and being temporarily lifted all over the place. And now we're a year later and, you know, telehealth has really got a firm footing. Um, these, the tech disruption is happening. It's, you know, it's further and greater along than it was a year ago. It's almost like this Rubicon's been passed or we've gotten over this hump. And now, you know, what are we going to do with all these licensing rules about who can prescribe, who can treat, who can, where the patient can be versus where the therapist or the doctor can be. And then how do you pay for it? So it's, it's a certainly an interesting kind of mess of questions that everyone's kind of fallen into. So it very much hasn't been settled yet. No, no. Um, you know, no, interesting. <laughs> not settled. No, not settled. Definitely. You know, I, I kind of monitor what's going on both in the federal space and in the states. Um, and it's not just specific to, you know, behavioral health here, though there's elements that are, but there are several groups that are pushing to make some of these waivers, make them permanent, make telehealth, the ability to pay for it, the, um, the co-pays and all of the deductibles make it the same. Don't rebuild the walls that everyone just tore down because of COVID. Let's figure it out and do do something a little bit differently. I agree. It would, it would be such a huge loss uh, to to go backwards. Uh, the The telehealth side is is so useful. Uh, mm -hmm. We we have wasted so much time waiting for an, for the doctor, right? It it it, it just. Uh, it's purely wasted time. I'm, I'd much rather wait at home while I, you know, work uh, right. on, until until they're available. That, that than uh, and and for so many things, and especially on the, on the behavioral health side, the, the, right? That they're, they're it, it seems to me that they're much less likely to need to you know physically touch me uh, or physically run a test. Well, there's. No, exactly. I mean, and also just as a society, we've gotten so used to having everything come to us when we want it and how we want it, that it, it seems kind of incongruous to go backwards and say, okay, except for healthcare, we still have to go be in in-person setting and then you have to make an appointment three weeks out. Um, that's a situation that no one's really happy with. And in the healthcare side, we've been trying to improve, you know, reduce wait times, improve people's access for years. So why wouldn't we want to capitalize on this huge opportunity and this disruption? Um, I don't see how it's possible to really go backwards. I mean, was it mostly regulation that, that was holding the providers back from, from uh, offering um, better service? Gosh, I mean, regulation was certainly a part of it. You know, insurance is regulated at the state level. I mean, it's regulated at both federal and state, but there's a big chunk of it that is regulated at the state level. And that's true for all insurance. Um, on top of that, when you've got managed care, you've got healthcare, you've got 
licensed physicians or licensed clinicians, and they're also regulated at the state level. So there's a very real element of state regulation. And, you know, you've got, I think we've got 55 jurisdictions and everyone does it a little bit differently. So there's that, but I think some of it also was just the unknown, you know, is it, do people really connect with a therapist or a healthcare provider over text? You know, that's, if you just think about the question, your first answer would be, well, of course not. It's nowhere near the same. Yeah, that's what but I would assume. That's what you would assume, sure. And, but that's not, that's not right necessarily. Um, and one of the things that I find really interesting, and I didn't bring any stats or anything with me to this, but we, I've taken a look at some of this stuff in the past and, you know, you would kind of expect your teens and your, your younger generation to pick up on text and to adopt it and use it for therapy and everything else. But really it's also kind of people who are working age and older people as well. It's not just limited to the, to the kids, but people have jobs and they have commitments and they can't just take off from work and go see a therapist. And also stigma is still a very real thing and they can't, or don't want their employer or their family or whatever to know that they're seeing a therapist. So the ability to have it, you know, on your phone or on your computer and just talk to someone and, and move on with your day is, is really huge for a lot of people. Ma makes so. sense. And, and, uh, is it, is it like, like, uh, the insure tech world where it's a matter of, of a lot of venture capital investment coming in or, or has it been, uh, the the has the investment been internal or has it been a lot of money coming coming in from outside to it's, invest in in this or it's both it's a very hot area as far as investment um on the treatment side primarily there are a lot of private equity and venture capital in mental health and substance use treatment providers and then also on the tech side uh, a lot of a lot of money coming in um it's in many ways, it, it's very exciting because it's it's very fertile and there's all this these great ideas coming out of these very young companies and there's an appetite for it. And so you're seeing the money coming in and then the investment and then people exiting and there's a lot of M&A activity happening in behavioral health. So it certainly is a, it's an industry that, well, I like it, but it, it has a lot of movement it's exciting from kind of an investment standpoint and what are the companies doing and the technology is moving so fast that you just have to run really fast to keep up uh, plus it's important you know it's it's just it's work that really is important for people and it affects them um you know, it affects their lives, it affects their families, it affects their ability to have a healthy, happy life. You know, it's it's the kind of work that when you um, kind of leave at the end of the day, you can think, okay, you know, maybe today I didn't do anything that exciting, but overall I'm in a good, solid, you know, industry that does good work for people. So no. and you don't hear that much about, you know, insurance. <laughs> Mm -hmm. or, yeah, that, that's a fantastic uh, feeling. Uh, absolutely, that, that's that's worth a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, how 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 is Medicare playing playing along? I'm I'm assuming Medicare advances a little slower than than the rest of the, of, of than the private side outside of the industry. Uh, Medicare does move at their own rate. Um, well, Medicare, you know, it's it's not just one thing. So on the healthcare side, you've got kind of. Medicare Part A and Part B, which you think of as, you know, the little red, white, and blue cards. And they have a set of rules that they operate under um, that don't track probably quite as closely to what's happening on the commercial side in behavioral health as far as what's covered and how it's covered. But there's also Medicare Advantage, which is Medicare, but it's offered through a private company and administered as if it was a commercial plan. So there's there's different rules and it's 
a little bit different animal, but it's more familiar to people um, who maybe have worked at a company for their career and then, and then they've retired. Those rules comply with kind of commercial. You have to run it as a commercial kind of health plan. So you're getting the same coverage mandates, you're getting the same reimbursement requirements as you would for commercial. Um, and then you've got Medicaid, which, you know, there's different variations of Medicaid and each state has their own. So it's, even though there's a lot of movement and a lot of growth and a lot of improvement, it still is very splintered, I guess, across the different jurisdictions. Any any predictions for the next five years of, of uh, the behavioral? Oh my gosh! Okay, so this is side? just me. I'm not. Yeah, the predicting the future is, is hard. Yeah. So predictions. Um, telehealth is. Gosh, I almost wonder if telehealth is going to almost drop the tele part, where it's just going to be come so normal and a component of healthcare that it ceases to be this kind of other kind of shiny object. Um, I think there's that. I think you're gonna see some real improvement and growth in the substance use treatment side. There's so much investment going into there and it has been for years, but now some of the companies are really starting to grow some legs and there's some, you know, variation and some different types of treatment being offered, which is always exciting that it's not just a one-stop shop um, for, you know, for treatment. So I think substance use treatment, telehealth, um, tech. Yeah, I think tech, the ability to offer even if it's not therapy per se, kind of what you would think of when you go see a therapist, but wellness and kind of whole person well-being services offered through applications, through, um, yeah, through applications or gosh, at, you know, in five years, maybe it's hologram or virtual reality. I mean, really, who knows? <laughs> It moves so fast. The virtual reality would, would be a very interesting way, way to do it. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm a bit of a, of a VR nerd uh, myself, I, uh, early adopter. I've, I've had multiple uh, gaming VR setups, and currently I, I have my, my uh, Oculus. Uh, you have an Oculus. Yeah, th so this is the, the, the Quest 2. Uh, okay. and, and I've been I, on a wish list forever. Th this I thing is, is really amazing b because... I have a massive gaming computer and I have a a, a room scale setup for for the uh, for the original uh, uh, Oculus and for the uh, uh, Vive and then the Index, but but those require a, a powerful gaming computer. This thing is I don't know a pound maybe less and it's integrated and it doesn't require the the head tracking. Uh, and and so so the the reason I, even though my use has been for gaming, the reason I bring it up. It is be because I have seen myself how quickly your 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 even though the, the the graphic quality is not as good as as you know uh, your normal gaming g gaming stuff, uh, your brain very very quickly goes like oh this is a new reality, uh, and and very quickly uh, takes it and 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 you feel like like you're there like like, like for example uh, heights uh, anything with with heights it takes you a while to get used to. Uh, and, and so I can absolutely ima see how, how uh, this could be used very, very effectively in, 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 in the uh, psychological health side. Oh, well, uh, in healthcare in general. I mean, just to think if you've got your provider with their, you know, VR set on and you're on your VR set and you can communicate and look Much more at naturally. Things, it's, yeah, much more naturally. Um, that's one of the, you know, in behavioral health, that's one of the concerns that um, folks had about will telehealth, does it really work? And a big part of it was visual cues. You know, with behavioral health, you're often meeting somebody and experiencing them at, you know, the worst moment of their lives. They're, they're in a crisis situation. 
or they're close to it. And so the therapist spends a lot of time or the physician or the, the psychologist, you know, reading cues and, you know, checking breathing level and, you know, that sort of thing to see, is this person safe? You know, is this a suitable interaction for outpatient? Um, and that's a challenge that I think, you know, VR, there's a lot of opportunity there um, to be able to feel like you're really there and get a better sense of visual cues. Certainly much better than, than text. You think, yeah, certainly much better than text. And yes, you know, there's, um, that kind of brings me to my other maybe, rec not recommendation, but where I think it might go. Um, AI, you know, is is probably the other AI really coming into its own and being able to um, not just communicate like a human, which is really close to doing that now, but being able to help inform a provider really very quickly about how to diagnose or how to treat um, one of the challenges in behavioral health. And there are many, many challenges, but one of the challenges is the science, you know, just isn't there as it is on the medical side. You know, there isn't the years and years and years of peer reviewed journals like you see in, with heart disease or diabetes or cancer. It's, um, it'll get there, but it's not there yet. And so to have a technology such as AI coming up that can help process and assist a therapist or provider in, in, in diagnosing and treating a patient very quickly um, that'll help also give better treatment and really help with outcomes because that's, that's the whole goal, you know, it isn't just about better behavioral health either. I guess that's the key. I think that's probably the key thing that's driving this explosion in behavioral health. It isn't just about behavioral health. It's about whole person care. It's about integrated care. Um, it's about treating the mind and treating, you know, the symptoms of a person's, you know, emotions and their, you know, I guess, yeah, their emotional health, the same way you would treat their physical health. And by doing that, you not only get the benefit of, you know, behavioral, which you do, you get it on medical. There's a lot of people that need help but they don't know it. They've got headaches or they've got stomach aches or heart palpitations or, you know, their, you know, their neck hurts and they just go to the doctor thinking, I need something for my headache. I need something for my heart and, and it's stress, you know, or it's depression or anxiety or something like that. So there's a, it's, I mean, it's really a, just an exciting industry. And are, are there any, great websites or any, how, how do you how do you best keep track of of, uh, of what's going on in 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 your side uh is, is there like like Gosh. the insurance side coverager seems to be the the place to to get your news and, and insurance nerds to, to get analysis and, and career advice uh is there is there anything in your where? side of the world that, that uh there's a few there's a few places so, and I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm just putting them out there. I'm not recommending them or anything like that. It's just, um, there's a, a good organization called Open Minds that is, well, they do all sorts of things. They do seminars and webinars, but they also push out a lot of articles and information. And that's really good for industry news. There are some neat organizations on the treatment side that are trying to put together best practices. The one that pops to mind is a group called Shatterproof, which is, um, they're only a couple of years old and it's kind of almost a little think tank of um, industry thought leaders that have come together and said, okay, we need to compile some best practices. So they're doing that. Um, there is a group called the National Council that is primarily provider-based and they do a lot of work um, in kind of pushing out information and education and all of that. Um, gosh, and there's there's a couple others, and I'm blanking. I might think of think of a few more. But if I think of where I go, kind of.
kind of on the regular, it's, I really take a look at, at open minds quite a bit. They're just good at, you know, daily what's happening out there. That's probably where I look them up. Awesome. That, that's quite a list of, of uh, recommendations. And, uh, and, and yeah, our, our disclaimer, <laughs> right. uh, we, we're, we're just playing Google where we're, we're not uh, endorsing anybody. Right. Uh, it's just that the sites that that, that uh, we ourselves visit. Uh, <laughs> uh, normally, I don't have to give the, dis the disclaimer, but but uh, s since you're an attorney, you, you <laughs> great. I'll do that. Yeah, you always feel like you have anybody. to. Uh, so so, uh, Noreen, thank you so much for 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 joining me today. Uh, well, it's it's been very interesting. Me. I I knew very little about, about about this side of 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 the health insurance industry and and of the, of the health side. In general, so it's been very interesting for me to learn, and, and I, I think that that uh, more than a few of the listeners will will uh, will will have significant uh, growth for, from uh, for, from from listening to this conversation, uh, since it since it's uh, such a different side of uh, of insurance. Sure, it is. It's it's a different side of insurance, and it's very um, clinical focused. I guess you know it's it's very clinical focused. But it's it's good work, and it's it's still insurance. It's still managed care. So thank you for having me. My my pleasure. It, it 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 goes to to show what I what I say all the time, which is that that within insurance, uh, we have work for people from from all backgrounds, and and, and oh especially goodness, yeah. uh, if it exists, it needs insurance. So so insurance touches it in some way or or another, and and it's very interesting how radical change happens when, when something goes from generally not covered to generally covered and all of a sudden you have all this <laughs> innovation kind so. of a shock yeah so very well, I, I also i think that you know at least with on the managed care side there's a component it isn't just insurance about you know who pays for it or the risk though it is that but it's also about population health it's about making sure that what is being paid for is is quality and that's a big big component of it on the on the healthcare side so lots of population health for those people who like that stuff awesome awesome Th thank you very much for, jo for joining me today thank you very much